Now Herman Narula, who is the co-founder and chief executive of Improbable, a London-based gaming company that recently struck an alliance with the Chinese internet group NetEase, valuing the company at more than two billion U.S. dollars, according to the Financial Times. Improbable develops software that enables thousands of people to play video games simultaneously. And the company has advised the Strategic Command of the British Armed Forces and the U.S. Department of Defense in military simulations. Before we meet with Herman, let's take a look at the trailer for Improbable's upcoming highly anticipated video game, Scavengers, which is out next year. When the asteroid struck, it remade our world. Your mission today shall not be easy. You won't go alone to the surface. In fact, I'm sending many teams. Collect the data I need. Take it if you must. Protect it if you can. The storms that play this world are dangerously cold. Warmth will be essential to your survival. Another day in paradise. I've located several sites that warrant investigation. You'll need food to keep your stamina up. Arm yourself and scavenge whatever supplies you may find. That's what I'm talking about. Looks like we've got competition. again sometime. That looks really incredible. But beyond the entertainment factor, Herman Narula sees much deeper meaning in gaming beyond defense simulations and multiplayer activity. Today, in a preview of his upcoming book to be published by Penguin, Herman is predicting the advent of something he calls the multiversal self or rich inner lives where the virtual world will offer an expansion of you and where online objects will become just as meaningful to humans as those in the real world. Please welcome Herman Narula to Voices 2020. Over to you, Herman. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's uh, really exciting to get to talk to this audience and to explore some of these ideas with you. Um, and I'm you know, really just pleased to be here. And I'm glad you got to see a little bit of uh, some of our work there in the game Scavengers, uh, which is very exciting, launching next year. And one of the first games to go beyond the use of a single machine or server to many computers working together to build a much more immersive world. So I think you know, what I'd love to do today is give you a little bit of history about you know, where we are today in the world of games and virtual worlds and how I think that's about to transform in a way that will impact not only, in my view, the industry of fashion, but really the whole notion of how we spend our time, how we define who we are, and how we make and form the most important relationships in our lives. So um, let's, let's dive in. Um, maybe a little bit of an introduction just to add to what uh, Imran said, but um, I found it improbable in this barn, actually, uh, with a few people from Cambridge, Rob, my co-founder, and others, um, just after graduating in 2013. And we're now at about 800 people. We're in China, the US, and Europe. We've been involved in everything from COVID modeling, defense simulation, to, to games. And all through that entire period, what was amazing to us was even from when we started to now, a billion more people became gamers. The global industry added so much more to its overall market cap that it's now larger than film and music put together and I think even multiplied a few times, depending upon how you measure things. And more than even that, if you think now about the experience of being a young person in affluent Western society, games dominate your culture. We've seen footballers performing dances that happened in, at first in Fortnite. We've seen streamers earn the revenue and return 
just by playing games online of major celebrities. And in some ways, the world is a little bit upside down. So I want to talk a little bit about how we got here and, and, and where I think we're going. Um, so let's, let's kind of jump into that. So, you know, if you're a gamer and if you're over the age, if you're under the age of 35, you're almost guaranteed to be uh, in this audience. But if you're not, um, you may look, of, look at games and sort of remember or recall these trivial toy activities, mostly single player, mostly played by people who were distracting themselves from some other activity. Um, you may also be looking at more casual games today, like things like Candy Crush, et cetera, which are very big revenue generators, but which perhaps don't necessarily reflect the real potential today in what people can do within gaming. And over the last sort of 20 years, a massive change has happened. And the biggest indication of that change is people have moved from spending most of their money and time playing single player games to playing games together. Multiplayer experiences in which what they do and why they do it is as much an extension of their social life and of a desire to have interesting new experiences with other people than it is simply a desire for entertainment. And that's kind of where I want to first begin by hopefully surprising you and departing from your current conception of why people play games and what they get from them. You know, in my view, games are in fact, you know, multiplayer games particularly, um, as we jump to the next slide, are in fact not really about entertainment. So that might be kind of surprising, you know, Surely games are an entertainment category, but actually there's a branch of psychology called self-determination theory, which for 30 years has you know, produced incredible experimental results. It's a widely accepted way of thinking about how people are motivated and why they do the things they do. And what we found in research in the games industry is that the primary reasons people remain engaged and keep playing games, especially online games and especially social games, boil down to three key motivations a desire to be and to become more competent at something, a need to relate to other people, and a desire to self-express and to be autonomous. And my contention is not only that games can and do fulfill these needs as well or better, in fact, than a lot of experiences that people have in the real world, but that games are beginning to become a genuine challenge to experiences in the real world that don't fulfill those needs as well as games can. And we'll come on to some examples of what that could be like. But it's very important to dispossess yourself of any notion that a game is in some way fake or artificial when it comes to fulfilling these needs. Um, as game developers, we can't fake it. You know, we can't make you think you had a related and a great experience with other human beings. You either have had one or you haven't. We can't fake your need for um, self-expression and autonomy. And that creates a very interesting evolutionary pressure on games. Games are gradually becoming more and more complex, richer and richer, and requiring greater technology to facilitate these more immersive experiences. And that's also telling in their revenue and in their engagement. Um, there are games today, like Fortnite, that have player populations of nations, and um, which generate revenue in the, in the billions per quarter. And they achieve this through incredibly retentive experiences that do fulfill these needs more and more effectively than their competition. Um, if we jump ahead, one immediate and fascinating consequence of this, and this is something that there's a lot of data to suggest the coronavirus pandemic has greatly accelerated, is that for a lot of young people, they're having meaningful moments, experiences that they remember, relate to, and that grow who they are entirely in games and virtual worlds. And in a sense, this might seem surprising and even a little alien to people. But if we look at the analogy of internet dating, we can see how what was once a sort of fringe thing, the idea that you would you know, meet someone and fall in love entirely online felt, you know, even when I was growing up, felt kind of weird, to Tinder and dating apps for a certain generation and demographic, the primary way in which they meet new people, to the point where it's almost weird to not meet new people uh, you know, through these methods and through these tools. In the same way, we now have a generation for whom having an experience inside a game isn't really any different from an experience they would have in the real world. And they're often, and this is crucial, they're often able to have experiences at a much younger age that they wouldn't be able to have in the real world. The social life that a game gives you is vastly in excess of the people you could just meet at school. And the kinds of responsibilities, including running and organizing groups, winning large sums of real money, um, making money by contributing to games, or being involved in a rich sort of social framework and grid that games provide young people, a, a lot of people don't have access to in the real world or aren't yet of age where that can happen. Even for older gamers, um, there's, a, there's, a real, there's a really interesting continuous attachment to game experiences. People don't seem to grow out of them. Even once they've had families or gotten older, their playtime reduces and becomes more regular. And the data is very clear on this. 
but they actually continue to mature in their appreciation and enjoyment for games. I think the only really critical error that an outsider could make when thinking about the industry would be to overly analogize with music and with film. Um, you know, games are not really, games are not really a, they are definitely art, but they're more than that. They're, they're a place in which new experiences are had, not only a place in which experiences are reflected upon. And that really changes their economics and their dynamics. Um, let's jump ahead and think a little bit about where we are today. So I would say, you know, without even thinking about the future with more and, uh, you know, more aggressive technological developments and greater adoption of gaming, especially in new and emerging markets, we're already at a tipping point. And it's a tipping point in which the spending in gaming and the weighted value of a game experience in someone's life is starting to cross over from the point where instead of games being something you do to fill time you have, games are something that the majority of gamers are seeking out doing and avoiding other activities to go and do and beginning to contest other forms of spending. That means that they are where culture is going to be born and increasingly where people are you know, discovering memes, language, terminology that leak out into the real world. If you've ever read a business plan that included the phrase leveling up or thought, of, or thought about experience in the context of, you know, of growing in the employee journey, we're starting to see HR and people start to use a great deal more language from video games. And that's unsurprising. Music is starting to reflect themes in video games. Sport is starting to reference and reflect, especially because of the crossover and demographic between young athletes and gamers, you know, it's starting to reflect the world, the world of gaming. So to me, the most, imp most important and most unusual impact on our culture comes from the egalitarian nature of connections in gaming and achievement in gaming. Video games today are the only place on the planet where rich or poor, um, you know, regardless of race, culture, or background, People are being mixed together, melted together, and forming and making relationships completely absent their real world status. In fact, due to the way the, the, uh, the demographics line up and the nature of some games, there are today people in active conflict zones, active conflict zones, likely match made in cooperative games with people who are on the other side of that conflict with them, unbeknownst to both parties. But it's a statistical certainty given the nature of, of games being played and the people that are playing them. That to me, raises all kinds of questions about how gaming can become a very powerful force for empathy in our world, but more importantly, a very a, a fundamental catalyst to our culture and do and, and you know and do and do that transformation towards a very different kind of and very interesting form of society. Perhaps what we hoped uh, social media would do, but which social media, due to its economic pressures, uh, may have been unable to do. So looking out further into the future and coming kind of to my own uh, perhaps my own prediction. Uh, I would say that we're heading towards something I would call the multiversal self. And the best way to explain and think about that is to analogize and relate back to what life was like before mass media and um, relatively accessible travel and relatively accessible access to consumer goods. You know, people lived no, no biologically different to us today, but lives in which their access to new ideas, languages, experiences, notions of self-identity and how they were reflected in culture were utterly, utterly different and unrecognizable from where they are today. And if you took uh, a European just post the Dark Ages and stuck them in a supermarket today, they would fall to their needs in, in confusion with the sheer bewildering array of variety and opportunity and mental richness that, that our society provides us. In the same way, as we move towards virtual worlds becoming not merely a reflection or an entertainment source or, or something people are doing on the side, but you know, large, thriving economies, generating their own experiences in which people can realistically have multiple selves, many identities, the ability to be someone very different in, in one or another game. I think we're moving to a world in which will be as rich to our conception of things today as that world just past us um, might seem, to, uh, as poor as that might seem to us today as, as well. Um, I think thinking about what this means for fashion, really any consumer industry or brand, um, it, it's, it's a fascinating topic. And to me, thinking of games as more life um, and beginning to start to consider them a cultural catalyst, a place where new celebrities will form, where new trends, experiences, needs, ideas, and even social movements are being born. Increasingly, we're even seeing things like political activity moving into um, and being reflected in the actions and behaviors of groups inside gaming. I think it'll become not merely a place for brands to go, but a place in which brands will be born. 
a place in which first class cultural ideas will emerge and begin to populate other aspects of how our society works. So I want to finish with just some thoughts on specific recommendations and viewpoints um, you know, for this industry. And I'm, I'm something of a fashion outsider, but I've always been a passionate uh, and very interested student of the history of how ideas such as you know, military fashion moving into menswear, uh, both after World War II or back um, you know, in the medieval era with ties emerging from the courts we wear. I'm very interested in how fashion is a reflection of where society is, and how its evolution is one as well. Um, I think that the key notion to, to focus on is authenticity. Um, if we think about sportswear or the emergence of popular sporting as an activity everybody did and then the need for fashion to fulfill you know, needs in that requirement and, and, and to create brands and ideas that supported that, authenticity and connection to actual athletes and people who are close to those first class ideas feels to me as an outsider is a very important, um, a very important ingredient. I think trying to, trying to superficially engage with the world of gaming, either by taking existing ideas and brands and merely placing them in games or vice versa, cheapens both domains and it would be easily seen through by consumers. I think the really hard but phenomenal opportunity for growth is in partnering early and partnering close with developers to both create content that is unique in the world of gaming, but genuinely place the strengths of and provides new forms of expression for brands and fashion ideas in the context of gaming. Um, there's some stats I would, I'd finish on that I think are really important. China, world's biggest fashion market, world's biggest gaming market as well. Um, and a really good indicator of where trends are going. The behavior and, and, and interest in online gaming in the Chinese domestic market is like nothing in the rest of the world. And it's a fascinating uh, viewpoint on what the future will look like for us here in the West as well. So we'd love to talk, have, you know, discuss questions with hopefully Iman here as well, but um, really enjoy talking to this group and very grateful for the opportunity. Um, so thank you all. Thank you so much, Herman. That's like, it's absolutely fascinating because it's a world uh, that I don't personally engage in. But, you know, when you think about these multiple selves um, and the, the opportunities that come with it, and you know, it's amazing how your talk actually connected with so many things we've heard at Voices so far, the importance of the Chinese market, um, the ability for uh, more inclusion and diversity because of, it, of the kind of physical limitations being uh, removed. Uh, we do have a lot of questions that came through, but sadly, okay. I, I only have time for one. Um, but there, there's one question from Berlin, from Veronica Dorosheva, and a very similar question from Chile, from Javi Contreras. And, and they're asking, in the long term, will people end up living in a virtual world more than a physical world? And how would that impact society? The way Javi put it was, with different virtual worlds thriving, do you believe in the future our avatars will become more relevant than our real selves? I think the best way to think about it is like an additional limb. It's not an ending or a reduction in the value of the physical world. It's an elevation of our human experience to other dimensions too. TV didn't kill theater, it changed theater. It didn't, you know, cinema isn't killed by video games, it's changed by video games. And I think a world in which there are new virtual worlds, uh, you know, for us to explore is just that. It's an expansion of territory. And I think we should believe in and trust in the ability for human beings to grow and fill the gap. You know, our needs, our desires, our wants, what it means to live a fulfilling life have grown exponentially in the last couple of hundred years. Um, and I can see this just growing even further, especially as we begin to live longer, you know, just consider what an aging and elderly population can get out of virtual worlds, uh, you know, that they cannot get out of the physical one. So uh, I think it's all relatively optimistic, um, for now at least. Okay, I actually have time for more questions, it turns out. So awesome. um, the other question that's, that's, that's come through is, you know, on this diversity and inclusion point, Tiffany is asking, how do these new technologies break down barriers and create greater access, for example, people with disabilities or people in remote areas? I think that they have a huge potential to do that. Um, they give people a level playing field and an opportunity to experience something. Again, there are, there are definitely, um, there's definitely more work to be done for certain kinds of disabilities to help people play games more effectively. A lot of companies are trying to do uh, a lot in that area. But I think in general, they're an equalizer and a leveler, especially when games begin to afford you an income for playing, which because of the economics of free-to-play games are more likely than not. We're even working on projects with some elements of that. That will mean that for a large population of people, they don't necessarily, they can have a second job or earn a small income um, playing video games. 
which will be a pretty strange, uh, strange experience indeed, and a big leveler and a big changer of people's fortunes. And and do you do you believe in the kind of importance of physical experiences still in this like rise of these like virtual worlds where everyone's spending? I mean, sometimes I see you know really young kids, and it seems they're like so immersed in their devices all the time. Like, what what role will physical experiences play? in the lives of this generation that's grown up with all these screens and games? I, I think, you know, I, we're physical people. Um, we're tactile. We, we're affected deeply by smell, by sound, by touch, by human contact. I think the pandemic has shown us just how much we value human contact. Um, again, I look at this like an enhancement. I think you might meet someone in a game for the first time, get to know them with some incredible experience. You then might go meet in a real-world location perhaps um, a restaurant or a place that even reflects some of your sensibilities and shared artistic interests in the game world. I think game worlds will flood into the real world. AR will allow that to happen. Um, you know, in fact, real world brands better embracing the changes that games are, re uh, are reaping will make that happen. A lot like sport. You know, sport is a virtual world we all live with, and it immerses us even when we don't engage in sport. It affects us even when we don't engage in sport. That's kind of my view on it. Okay. Well, Herman, thank you so much for your time today and your fascinating presentation. And Good luck with the launch of Scavengers next year. Thank you. All right. Talk soon. Thank you very much. Bye.